A good morning to all of you. I hope you can all hear me now. We welcome you to another session of our webinar series co-organized by the Government Medical Officers Association and the Society for Health Research and Innovation. Today's topic is Essentials of uh, Point of Care Using Large Ultrasound for Emergency Care Doctors. And as usual, let me get on to the housekeeping rules. The webinar link will be available from 9 a.m. to 9.50 a.m. to join in, and no late attendees will be entertained thereafter. Each attendee should have been attended till the end of the webinar to obtain the certificate for CPD points, and these CPD points are strictly adhered to the NCCPD guidelines. We have enforced these rules to improve and maintain the standards of our CPD programs conducted here at SHRI. So we warmly welcome you to join in interactively in this session today. And we thank you for strictly adhering to these CPD regulations and for your kind compliance. As usual, I would like to request all of you to mute your microphones and offer to switch off your video so that there would be no interruptions during our session. And also we would be opening our chat box for your queries. There will be a Q&A session at the end of this webinar. So please kindly type in any of your queries during our lecture. Also, since there is the power outage in the island, we would type in a telephone number on our chat box for you to send us a message if you get logged out during the power outage. Without further ado, I would like to introduce to you our distinguished lecturer today, Dr. Nuan Varnakula, who is a consultant emergency physician at the Colombo North Teaching Hospital, Ragama. Over to you, sir. Um, uh, good morning to everybody. I am uh, Dr. Nuan Varnakula. I'm really happy and privileged to be here talking to you today on the essentials of uh, point of care lung ultrasound for emergency care doctors. All right, so this is the roadmap for the lecture. Uh, the first part will be looking at the literature on uh, lung ultrasound, LAS, or we call it a nickname CUS, chest ultrasonography. And then the basics of uh, ultrasound, then a little bit on the portable ultrasound, and then to the major part of the uh, talk, the sonographic signs of uh, lung ultrasound and the clinical syndromes of lung ultrasound. Then at the end, we'll be discussing building everything into uh, building everything together into these protocols, do protocols and false protocol. Okay, let me start with this uh, interesting part in the history. In 1939, when the mighty Russians invaded uh, the weaker looking uh, smaller nation, Finland, to uh, expand the empire, the old Russian empire, and the Finnish were thought to not to last a few weeks, but uh, to the contrary, the Finnish fought very well. They fought for more than three months. They fought with you know reindeers, and they had these uh, uh, ski soldiers, which were very effective in ambush fights. They had their homemade. Uh, you can see these uh, uh, bombs made of alcohol. So ultimately the mighty Russians actually didn't last for more than three months. So lung ultrasound similarly has been looked down as a uh, not a very significant modality of uh, diagnostic uh, yield. You can see these uh, quote because the lung ultrasound energy is rapidly dissipated into air. It is not useful for the evaluation of pulmonary pharenchyma. This was about say good uh, seven years ago. But since then, I would say the lung ultrasound has emerged as a hero from zero, uh, like the underdog. You can see the the David, the first king of Israel, facing the Goliath. So if I might say the acute dyspnea, the killers, is a Goliath. So we have the tool, the similar simple tool, the lung ultrasound. Let's see how we can 
mobilize our simple tool in the uh, next few minutes. So these are the clinical syndromes assessed in lung ultrasound. Uh, pneumothorax, pulmonary edema, pleural effusions, pneumonia, pulmonary embolism, and pericardial tamponade. So to start with, what does the literature tells you on lung ultrasound? So this was an interesting paper published by Leichenstein in 2014, which shows the sensitivity and specificity of uh, lung ultrasound uh, compared with the CT as a gold standard. So you can see for pneumothorax, it has a very significant, very impressive sensitivities around 95 to 100%. And uh, for plural effusions, 94%, and not to mention the impressive specificities as well. Uh, okay, this study, which was done in Alberta, uh, that shows uh, the lung ultrasound having a sensitivity almost twice as more than the chest x-rays for diagnosis of pneumothorax. An interesting study done in the emergency care setup where they did an intervention of a uh, training of a lung ultrasound module for the ED doctors. This training, mind you, is only for two hours. So after the two hour training course, the diagnostic uh, sensitivities of lung ultrasound among these doctors were assessed. Again, the CT has the gold standard. Uh, you can see the sensitivities, it's about 86.4%. And the mean time for diagnostic uh, scan was about two minutes compared to chest X-ray, which actually took about 12 minutes. I reckon this is not very far from our setup, our local setup as well, to get a chest X-ray in an unstable, acutely dysnic patient is a challenge itself. So after two hours of training, emergency physicians showed a good, uh, excuse me, give me a minute. Can you get rid of this screen? Oh, thanks. All right. Can everybody hear me? That's okay. Again, it's coming up. Uh, all right. So uh, I'm going to go ahead with the advantage of advantages of lung ultrasound in the emergency care setup. So as we discussed, it has a very uh, impressive sensitivities and specificities for most important differentials of acute dyspnea. And the rapidity of testing, real-time images, uh, of course, no radiation exposure to the patient. And you can assess the improvement and you can assess the response to your treatment uh, with the ongoing trends and the changes in lung uh, scan signs. It's cost effective. And as we saw in the last paper, this has a very quick learning curve. So that's very interesting for the emergency care setup. So a little bit on the portable ultrasound. So over the years, the ultrasound machine has improved significantly. So it has now, actually, you can carry your machine in your pocket. So this machine, you can connect to your uh, mobile device or the tablet, and you can borrow the screen and use it as you use a normal ultrasound machine, as you would use a normal ultrasound machine. So it has a very good resolution and clarity of images. Uh, overall, so it's a very interesting change, very interesting uh, innovation 
So it's the if you discuss about the uh, advantages of pocket ultrasound, the portable ultrasound. So you can see it's very emergency friendly. So you can have situations where you don't get power, such as in disasters, maybe field care, like you know retrieval and rural medical uh, facilities. So you, it, it, the users are kind of a uh, uh, immense. There's an immense uh, user friendliness with the portability of the ultrasound. Okay, so let's start our journey against the might of the acute dyspnea. All right, to uh, start with, I will just lay the outline of the uh, talk. The emergency ultrasound for acute uh, SOB can be divided into lung and pleural ultrasound and the focused cardiac echo uh, supplemented by the inferior vena carve assessment and uh, four point venous scan as well. All right, so let's dig into the focus lung and pleural uh, ultrasound. So start with, uh, if I, what if I tell you all of the knowledge and applications of lung ultrasound is just, uh, you know, centered among these, you know, handful of signs. So the, these 11 signs, which I'm going to talk about uh, in the latest uh, slides, if you actually get, get the basics, you know, you have mastered ultrasound, you know, the basics, you know, maybe the next one hour or so. All right, so let's talk about ultrasound to begin with. So, you know, the audible human uh, range for sound is uh, 20 kilohertz, about which at the level of two megahertz to 15 megahertz, we use a medical ultrasound. So the basics are, you get these uh, piezoelectric uh, elements in the probe, which can convert the electrical energy to sound energy. So these sound waves, they are emitted by this probe, is then reflected by the tissues. Depending on the, you know, the ultrasound uh, profile of the tissues, the reflections, they just differ. So these reflections are again received by the same probe and these uh, sound waves are then converted back into electrical impulses. Mm -hmm. These electrical impulses are then carried to the computer which analyzes them and shows them in a graphic display of the spectrum of intensities that they received. So the transducers, so you can see uh, there are main, you got three types of transducers, out of which one on your left, the linear probe and the curvy linear probe. These transducers are the friends of ultrasound. The phased array is mainly used for cardiac ultrasound. And uh, if you take these uh, portable ultrasound, you can have all three probes in one single unit, one single probe. So they change the way the ultrasounds are emitted and they just uh, stimulate the different uh, arrays of probes. So linear probe, so it has a, a ultrasound range of five to 13 megahertz. The curvy linear has one to eight megahertz. So you can see none is actually superior to other, but usually we take the resolution uh, the best resolution is with the linear array. So for the ultrasound, as we learn in the uh, further slides, it doesn't penetrate much. So you don't need the depth as you would get from a curvy linear. So in that uh, aspect, people say the linear array is the best for ultrasound. But in a personal note, I would actually prefer the curvy linear. It is just as good as the linear. Only difference is the resolution is better with the linear array, but the curvy linear can get kind of a big uh, field for you. So it's like a quick scan if you are used to it. All right, so the probe orientation. Uh, we can orient the probe with the marker. You just uh, see a marker on the probe. You orient the marker of the probe to the screen. The screen also has a marker. 
So you can orient yourself which side is which by just checking the screen and tapping on approve. And then uh, usually the ultrasound, we go for the longitudinal scan as opposed to transfers, we use rarely as you would learn in the future slides. In the case of refractions, you would prefer the transverse approach, but mostly it's the longitudinal approach. All right, so we would be scanning mostly the sagittal planes in the lung ultrasound, the probe placements. So this is very interesting. This is one of the slides that I want you to uh, keep in mind. So you can see there are three lines, the mid clavicular line, uh, then the mid axillary line, then the posterior axillary line. So each line uh, depicts a, a separate you know, region for scanning. So each uh, line actually uh, you can use it to, uh, depending on the clinical question, you'd be examining maybe one line, maybe all three lines. We'll discuss it further. So you can see the uh, mid clavicular line are uh, best for pneumothoraces because you can see it uh, actually sees the anterior most part of the lung. And compared to that, the posterior axillary line is best for uh, say ARDS and pleural effusions for pneumonias and APO, the mid axillary line is, uh, is best. Little bit on the physics of ultrasound. All right, so you can see, if I would like to bring up this uh, famous character, Suarez, into our lecture. So the Suarez is just, you can see, is uh, trying to find his uh, way uh, just uh, imagine this is a this is what this was at night, so you can see the light cannot penetrate you know uh, rocks. So you have to you know go beyond. Uh, you have to negotiate uh, in between the rocks, and when the light hits an object, it just bounces into the eyes. So the reflections are perceived in a spectrum of uh, uh, wavelengths. We call it the rainbow uh, spectrum. But in ultrasound, you get the same principle, but you get everything in uh, uh, shades of gray, starting from the whites to the blacks, the deepest blacks to the whites. It's just a spectrum. So I would like to call them 50 medical shades of gray. So if you uh, send the ultrasound beam through a fluid medium, so for an example, it could be urine, blood, uh, pleural fluid or acidic fluid. Uh, the ultrasound would just, you know, go through them, cut through them very nicely because fluid is very ultrasound friendly. So there'll be a lot of absorption. So when there's absorption, nothing would come to your probe as a feedback. So what you get is a black screen. What you get is a black area. Similarly, if you bounce it towards a bone, what happens is the bones you cannot con conduct ultrasound. They just reflect everything. So what you get is you get the maximum uh, number of feedback. So when you receive maximum uh, feedback, you, the color would be white, the total whitish appearance in, on your screen. So if you, what if you get this through a medium in between, like it's not completely uh, solid, it's not completely water. So as in the case of liver, so what happens is you will get an image somewhere in between these two extremes. That is again, you know, the shades of gray. All right, so a little bit on the ultrasound machines. I think uh, the scope of this lecture is not, you know, ex you know, going into the basics of ultrasound machine. So I would like to just to touch on the basic three modes. So B mode is the one that we use all the time. The M mode is quite different. So it's like it's, we are going through a section of the body and map it with the uh, time. So you get a waveform like appearance, which you cannot identify structures, but you can see the real time changes in the cross section of a structure. So B mode is the one that we commonly use. You can see the M mode is also very beneficial in lung ultrasound. All right, the patient positioning. We would like to have supine patients. Mostly what we get, the patients who are very sick, so you can't actually have them upright but you can have the scan, you can scan them upright as well. 
All right. So uh, you put the probe to the patient's chest. We discussed about the uh, regions that we are going to scan. Then uh, the very important thing, always keep your probe perpendicular to the skin surface, 90 degrees to your skin. So you have to appreciate that your body is not like a box. So it's it has their curves. So appreciate the curves and keep the probe oriented 90 degrees to the skin. That makes the uh, images really nice. And use ultrasound gel. This may be looked down, but actually, if you use gel, you are improve. You will improve your quality of the images very significantly. So let's place the probe in the mid clavicular line in the second intercostal space. Uh, say if you are starting on the right side, you name it R1, the region uh, right one. If you do it on the left side, we call them uh, left one, region left one. Uh, then anchor your probe in between two ribs. So that's the way to start. Then the probe marker should face the patient's head. All right, now imagine again our character uh, is shooting ultrasound. He got an ultrasound probe. He's shooting ultrasound to the uh, lungs. So you can see the two ribs, they just you know reflect everything back. So you would get complete shadows beyond these two ribs. In between, you get the soft tissues. So you get some feedback. You get some nice reflections in between uh, blacks and whites. But beyond this layer, the pleura, actually, it's just air. So air is uh, quite an enemy for ultrasound, as we learned in the first slides. So air just, just dissipates everything, so reflects everything away. So you can't get any uh, feedback when the ultrasound beam hits the pleura. So beyond the pleura, actually, there's nothing coming to the scan probe. So that brings us to the first sign in lung ultrasound, the bat sign. So we're starting with the bat. So you can see if you keep the probe, as we mentioned earlier, so you can see the two, I hope you can see my cursor, can you see? Yeah. So you can see the two reflections on the ribs. So now you have to imagine, right? These are the two wings of the bat on either side. The body just, you know, floats in between. So you see there is a nice uh, thin line, whitish line. So what do you think this would uh, uh, depict? So this depicts the pleura, the parietal versus the visceral pleura, just sliding on each other, beyond which you can't see anything. So these are, or everything beyond these uh, whitish line are just artifacts. It's not real. Right? So everything we learn, you know, just limited to these parts. If your lungs doesn't have any water, like we discussed in the later slides. All right, so these are clean shadows. We call them dirty shadowing and clean shadowing. So clean shadows doesn't have anything beyond them. So they are really black, but the dirty shadowing has some artifacts. All right, so uh, the reverberation artifacts. So when the sound waves, they hit the parietal pleura, they just you know bounce back and forth, back and forth. They create like an uh, kind of infinite number of reverberation patterns down below. They are actually called classic uh, sign, the A lines. So A lines would be something like this. If you stand in between two mirrors, you will see indefinite, I mean, like an infinite number of uh, similar images, recurring, recurring, and goes to the, I mean, like, uh, goes to the periphery endlessly. So the similarly, the plural line, up to the plural line, the soft tissues, then the intercostal muscles, the reflection of these are just repeated back and again and again by the ultrasound ma machine. This is just an artifact. So these uh, repeat, uh, repeated lines of the pleura in equidistance are called the A lines. All right. So then if you do the M mode on this uh, dirty shadow area, so you get this specific uh, pattern. We call it, it's again a very nice, you know, ultrasound has lots of nice uh, uh, metaphors. So this is a seashore. 
So seashore is, you can see now the beach is the plural and beyond. So the sea is your uh, plural line and the intercostals and the soft tissues are your sky. So you can see this uh, specific uh, pattern, we call it seashore sign in a mode, in a normal lung. All right, so A lines can be a normal finding. It's usually a normal finding. But if you have asthma or COPD, all you get is A lines. And even if you have a pneumothorax, you get A lines. So we'll see how we are going to differentiate these. All right, this brings us to the sign three, the lung sliding. All right, the lung sliding is, you can see when the parietal pleura uh, just floats on the visceral pleura, the visceral pleura just, you know, glides on the parietal pleura. So because there is some little bit of water in between this pleural space, that you can see it's very ultrasound friendly. You can see a thin hyperechoic line. Everything is reflected back. So this uh, sliding, causes a shimmering effect in the scan. This is very important that you uh, get a grasp of this. So you can see a subtle movement of the parietal pleura versus the uh, visceral pleura uh, with the uh, hypechoic line, the pleural line. This is called the march of ants. So if you see very nicely, you can see a little bit of ants in your lungs. They are just marching. They, are, they don't march in a unidirection as the you know, normal ants would do. They just march back and forth, back and forth. So it's very important you grasp this. When you see this, you are quite happy. So you know your pleura, the parietal and visceral line are actually uh, opposed to each other. They are intact. There's nothing in between. So, so taking a kind of a example, if you have air in between these two pleurae, so what happens is you can't have this uh, sliding effect. So what you get is, loss of the sliding effect we call absent lung sliding so you can see in this image there is a kind of a movement but mind you you if you see if you focus on the plural line you can see it just doesn't move so what moves is the whole image just moves because of the breathing efforts of the intercostals you can see a movement but the secret, the key lies in keeping your eyes on the pleural line. So if there's nothing moving in between the parietal and visceral pleura, you are sure there's no uh, movement there. So we call it absent lung sliding, which is a quite an important sign in detecting a pneumothorax. Uh, now what happens if you put the M mode now? So if you see the M mode, you can see, so you lose, the pleura, because you don't have the visceral and parietal pleura uh, gliding on each other. So you lose the beach. So what you get is just the sky and ocean. So what happens is now we call it a barcode sign. So barcodes are like, you know, commonly you, you can see any uh, product is marketed with this computer scannable barcode. So this is the similar uh, metaphor we use, the barcode or stratosphere sign, right? Okay, any more specific sign for pneumothorax? So we got, we go to the sign four, which is the lung point. So now you started your scan from the second intercostal space in the mid clavicular line, the anterior chest, okay? Now what you had to do is you can slide your probe down and go to the other intercostal spaces. You go up to the seventh intercostal space when you get a specific uh, transition, what you get is a lung point where you get the gliding of the visceral versus the parietal pleura just stops in one point because in beyond which you get the pneumothorax. So you've been tracking the pneumothorax with no movements. Suddenly you get, a, get an area where you see a little bit of sliding. So this transition of uh, the sliding versus non-sliding is really specific for pneumothorax. We call it a lung point. Okay, so 
just to be sure, you can actually mobilize your other weapon, the M mode. So when you do the M mode, what you can see is you can see an area with no beach sign and suddenly you can see the beach sign appearing in the middle. So this actually points out where the transition between the pneumothorax and the normal lung is, which we call a uh, uh, lung point. All right, now if you see this uh, ultrasound scan, you can see where the red arrow is shown. Yeah, so you can see beyond the red shadow, the lung sliding is just, you know, abruptly stops. So that is the abnormal lung. So in the right side, you get the normal lung. So this is a lung point. All right, but mind you, there are a few other conditions that uh, actually would have reduced lung sliding. So one is, you know, if you have a neonectomy, so in that case, you will have a history. And if you have intubated your patient, one lung intubation, you can see, one side usually so what happens is usually on your left lung as the main stem uh, intubation is usually to the right bronchus you can see on your left lung there will be you no know, uh, lung sliding so if you have atelectasis then you can see uh, there's no uh, lung sliding but later we will discuss further how to differentiate this the key is finding a static air bronchogram, which I'm going to discuss in the uh, later slides. Then if you have pleuropharynchymal adhesions, then pleural, subpleural bullae and pneumonia. Pneumonia, because the lungs are not aerated well, you don't see a nice lung sliding as usual. So uh, in that case, you will see some other signs which are, we are going to explore in the next slides. All right, so a little bit on rib fractures. As we mentioned earlier, if you keep your probe in a transverse uh, orientation, now the transverse orientation uh, to keep it oriented with the ribs in the midclavicular line, and you can scan them from the midline to the posterior axillary line. So when you do that, as we earlier discussed, the bones are very bad ultrasound conductors. So they throw back all the ultrasound back into the probe. So you see a, a thin hyperechoic line in a bone, beyond which is a kind of a, a true shadow. But now you get a hyperechoic line with a kind of a disruption in between. So when you put your probe, your patient gets kind of a tenderness. You get the maximal probe tenderness as well. So you know this is where you get the refraction. In fact, for subtle rib fractures, the ultrasound is quite sensitive. Even if you can't pick them on your chest X-ray, you can pick them with your ultrasound probe. So this may not be very useful for the acute trauma, uh, especially polytrauma, but uh, patients who are quite stable and who are having a kind of a nagging pain, chest pain, you want to you know, diagnose them, the cause of the origin of the pain. So this, is a, this becomes handy. So sometimes you get uh, hyperechoic uh, areas, the collections, which depicts the hematoma of the refracture. All right. Then we come to a kind of a enemy of our talk, the subcutaneous emphysema. So when you get subcutaneous emphysema, you get a false uh, hyperechoic lines, which are actually the pockets of air, which blocks, which causes a dirty shadow here. So beyond which you can't see any uh, kind of a, a lung signs. So for the first sign would be bat sign. So in this case, you won't see a bat sign. So however much you search, you get the orientation with your ribs, but you fail to get a bat sign. So only you get these, this, you know, irregular hyperquick areas with dirty shadows. These are called E lines. So this is a subcutaneous emphysema. So when you have a subcutaneous emphysema, you can't, ob you obviously can't see much beyond the uh, collection of air. All right, the sign five. This is called uh, B lines or lung rockets. Uh, the lung rockets 
I'd like to discuss a little bit on the acute alveolar interstitial syndrome. So this is a heterogeneous group of conditions with pathologic involvement of the pulmonary interstitium and resulting in impaired gas exchange and abnormal increased lung water content and reduced air entry in the alveoli resulting in fluid leakage into the pulmonary interstitium and alveolar spaces later. So this condition actually is quite you know, beneficial for our scanning. So when you have fluid in the lungs, uh, which act, uh, displaces uh, air, so now you have a kind of a friendly medium for the ultrasound. So your ultrasound beams now has the opportunity to dig deeper and see the deeper structures. So this is, this is the only condition where your uh, ultrasound uh, uh, waves can penetrate your lungs beyond the pleura, be, uh, deeper than the pleura. So if you have uh, uh, ARDS, interstitial pneumonia, pulmonary fibrosis, lung contusions, ARDS, and pulmonary edema, so all these conditions can cause uh, fluid accumulation in the interstitial spaces, and therefore you get different, different um, signs, which we are going to explore later. All right, so if you have water now, inside your interstitium, lung interstitium, now you can see the ultrasound waves are transmitted like, you know, torch lines or maybe spotlights, you know, going through from the skin into the deeper most part of your scan beams. So when you have interstitial edema, you get kind of a discrete short lines. So if you have alveolar edema, they are quite, you know, bigger and confluent. Right, so B lines, so what are B lines? The B lines are, they are vertical, strongly hyperechoic. They are like lasers, like spotlights. They have sharp margins. Usually they present some pathology. When there is a fluid replacing air in lungs, sound waves, they travel deeper and erases the A lines. So when, they, when you get B lines, you get erasure of the A lines. Then, these B lines, again, this is also very important. These B lines also moves with the respiration. So when you have a kind of a reduced uh, lung sliding with pneumonia, but if you have B lines, very easy to you know, exclude a pneumothorax because now you can see these uh, B lines, the comet tail lines, like March of fans, they also just travels back and forth, back and forth with the respirations. Okay. Now these B lines, the number, when you start the pulmonary edema, you get you know, discrete B lines, but when you get the advanced pulmonary edema, they just quells with each other and they form very uh, wide uh, uh, B lines. So similarly, if you treat them, so if the patient comes out of the pulmonary edema, you can see the resolution with the disc, you know, these uh, quells lines become discrete lines and they just fade away. Okay, this brings us to pulmonary edema. So when you have pulmonary edema, it's usually bilateral. You get diffuse B profile and they get basal and anterior distribution. So these, uh, if you get in a chest X-ray, you get the upper lobe diversion. So these uh, accumulation of fluid, it just, you know, uh, doesn't adhere with the gravity. It just, you know, beyond the gravity. So say, similarly, you can see these B profile is now present, not only your basal lungs, in your anterior lungs as well. So this has uh, sensitivity and specificity around nine, more than 95% respectively to diagnose pulmonary edema if you see these uh, typical B lines. Okay, so diagnosis of cardiogenic pulmonary edema uh, include, you know, you can get pleural effusions as well, and you can have the distension of your inferior vena cava and there will be a, a loss of respiratory collapse of the IVC. And you can see your cardiac output is going to be very minimal. And you can have, a, you can have the cardiac uh, dysfunction on your echo. And you can see your IVC is going to be quite descended, somewhere in between more than you know, 2.5 with uh, no respiratory collapse, no respiratory variability at all. So this can be you have to augment, you have to supplement your lung ultrasound with your echo and your abdominal uh, subsifoid IVC uh, measurements. 
All right. So a little bit on the acute respiratory distress syndrome. So ARDS, you get multiple B lines uh, in homogeneous distribution. So you can have small subplural consolidations with uh, mainly these uh, areas are located in the posterior and basal parts of the lungs. So you get punctuate hypechoic foci of air bronchograms within the consolidations. Uh, so uh, air bronchograms are again uh, a sign of ARDS. It can be present in uh, pneumonia as well. Uh, and you can have a normal diastolic function on your cardiac echo. So pleural effusions, this brings us to another artifact it's called a mirror artifact. So when you scan uh, in the posterior axillary line, so you will see a point called plaps point, we are, which we're going to discuss a little bit uh, later. So in this plaps point, we call it, uh, because you can see the liver, the diaphragm and the lung superiorly in between. Uh, so this area, if you get any fluid, if you don't get any fluid, what happens is in normal uh, patient, you will see these uh, diaphragm actually kind of uh, uh, focuses the reflected ultrasound together and forms a similar mirror-like liver-like image about the diaphragm as well. So this, this is an artifact, just like you get the A-lines, you get an artifact, we call it mirror image, mirror artifact. So if you have something like a foreign substance uh, above the diaphragm, now say if you get some pleural fluid, so the, now you can see the fluid is a good conductor of ultrasound. Now you can see the pleural fluid. Now you get the loss of the mirror artifact. So if you have kind of a, a fluid above your diaphragm, you get the loss of the mirror artifact as in this case. Okay, you can see the both uh, plaps points, both right and left. So on your left, you see the uh, spleen and then the diaphragm and above which you get the tip of the lung. So if you see a liver like, uh, you know, spleen like architecture, again, this is a mirror artifact. So on your right, you get the liver uh, forming an image. On your left, you get the spleen forming an image. So these are called mirror artifacts. But if you have fluid, you get the loss of these artifacts. All right, the pleural fluid is going to just do that. So ultrasound is really impressively 100% sensitive for detecting effusion. So I think all of you have done dengue scans in your wards. So I think you are quite familiar with this, uh, detecting small effusions. So to get the effusions, you go to this uh, plaps point. We call it, uh, you have to slide your probe in the posterior axillary line, and you go to the intersection of the 10th and 12th ribs, and you go up. So when you go up, when you get the diaphragm, when you go up, you can see the diaphragm coming into your view. So when you get the diaphragm, you are in the plaps point. So this is the best uh, position you get you catch your pleural effusions and sometimes you know consolidations so we always in lung ultrasound we have a special place for this we call it uh, plaps point so we call it posterior lateral alveol and pleural syndrome point plaps point uh, the indicator should uh, point towards the patient's head and you go to the intersection of your posterior axillary line with the 10th and 12th rib, uh, uh, ribs. If you cut through the 10th or 12th rib, you might find the plaps point. So in your plaps point, you get another sign. We call it lung sliding. So when you get this plaps point, you can see you get to an uh, area where you get with your each inspiration, your lung is going to push the liver down. So it's like a curtain just you know coming down in a theater. So we call it curtain sign. Then another interesting sign, we call it spine sign. So again, we apply our principles. So you see, when you get normal lung tissues, so when your ultrasound beam just cuts through your diaphragm, it cannot go because there's air. The tip of the lung is just full of air. So you can't see anything beyond the diaphragm here. But say if you get some uh, thin rim of fluid here, so what happens is now your ultrasound just can cut through and reach the deeper structures. 
the deeper structure is your vertebral uh, bodies. So earlier, you see, if you don't have any fluid effusion, your vertebral line just stops here. Because simply, your ultrasound is just blind to your vertebral bodies because nothing is you know, gained from here. All is reflected. But if you have fluid in here, you can see the continuation of your vertebral line above the diaphragm. So we call it the spine sign. It is again an indirect sign that you have some fluid in your uh, basal lungs. You can see it better here. So if you have an effusion, you can see the spine is just continuing above the diaphragm. Through the liver it comes. In normal patient, it stops here at the start of the diaphragm. But now, if you have fluid here, the spine sign just continues like a train. All right, a few signs. In your PAPS point, you can calculate actually the effusion. Uh, so you get this cod sign. So you get the intersection of uh, two rib shadows. Then you see these lines uh, of your effusion. So you can see the maximum height of the effusion. Okay, so we'll go to the next uh, important uh, goliath in our acute dysnic patient. Uh, so pneumonia. So in pneumonia, we get some interesting signs. One is the shred sign, which we are going to discuss in the next slides. So in consolidated lung, you get the dynamic air bronchograms. We'll see how they look in ultrasound. Then you get B lines as in pulmonary edema, but now it could be unilateral. If you have bacterial pneumonia, you can have unilateral B lines. Usually pulmonary edema is uh, bilateral and you, you can have bilateral B lines in viral pneumonias as well. And tissue density and consolidation. So you, if you can see uh, when the lungs are kind of uh, inflamed with fluid, you can see they look like liver. So we call it hepatization in pathology. So similarly, you can see the hepatized lung tissues with your ultrasound because you know the hepatized tissues, they have water, they have uh, exudates and transudates. So it helps to uh, transmit ultrasound. You can now visualize your lung. This is not actually the mirror image. This is not a mirror artifact. You can, you can just uh, you know, uh, differentiate these because you have some paradeumonic effusions and you can have the air bronchograms. All right, then you can have some lung sliding uh, reduction and you can get some effusions, paranemonic effusions as well. And you can have this specific lines we call C lines. So C lines, they come with an irregular pleura and just below the pleura, you can have some subpleuric collections and you can have small uh, non-continuing uh, artifacts, uh, small uh, waves, which we call C lines. So C line is quite, uh, specific for pneumonia. So this is a shred sign. You can see the pleura is like a, you know, it's irregular, like a shredded cheese. And you can have some collections, pleural fluid, in the, uh, above the pleura, the, above the uh, visceral pleura. Then sign 11, we come to the last sign, the plankton sign. So when you have exudates, so when you have effusions, this effusion could be a transudate, it could be an exudate. So if you have an exudate, you get lots of uh, shiny particles. We call them plankton sign. So you can see the plural effusion is like a small ocean where you have the plankton, you know, floating and making a shimmering uh, glittery appearance. So we call it, uh, this is a classic sign of an exudative plural effusion. Sorry, I think I missed one uh, slide. So jellyfish sign. So it's again a sign of uh, pleural effusion. You can see this uh, small area of the collapsed lung. It just you know protrudes like small uh, tentacles of a jellyfish. So you can see now because of the pleural effusion, now you can see the hepatized lung nicely. So this is called a jellyfish sign. This is again a sign of uh, pneumonia plus uh, paranemonic effusion. Okay, now come, we'll come to the bronchograms. So bronchograms are quite uh, specific for the diagnosis of uh, pneumonia. 
So you can see when this patient breathes, you can see a white line just you know coming up like a you know indicator of a scale, just comes up and down, up and down. So this is a, a dynamic air bronchogram. So when you have trapped air inside your uh, fluidy lung, you get this uh, whitish streaks of uh, fluid collections, uh, of air collections. But you can see some areas, these air are just uh, trapped. So these are trapped air, can't move. They just move with the whole lung. They can't move relative to the lung. So if you can't have them uh, relative movement relative to the lung, we call them uh, static bronchograms. So both static and uh, dynamic bronchograms are seen in pneumonias. All right, so one of the killers in uh, acute dyspnea, the pulmonary embolism, one of the most elusive uh, differentials. So you can have few changes, which are quite rare. I would say I have never seen this. Uh, you can get in the lung, you can get subpleural consolidations, which manifest as a wedge or triangular shaped heterogeneous uh, lesion. This is due to the pulmonary infarcts. So if you get them, it, they have a quite a good sensitivity and specificity for diagnosis of PE. And you can have uh, localized effusions if you have a uh, pulmonary infarct. Uh, and you can have evidence of DVT. And you can have evidence of right ventricular strain in your echo. So if you do a focused cardiac echo, you can see the RV is just you know, uh, struggling because the outflow is you know, quite severely obstructed with a thrombus. And if you do a four point venous scan, you can see if you push your vein with your ultrasound probe, usually the vein just completely collapses uh, compared to the artery, which doesn't uh, collapse even if you press harder. But if you have a clot, uh, your vein just you know refuses to collapse. So if you scan it, you can do a kind of a two uh, popliteal veins and do the uh, two femoral veins. You can do a four point uh, venous uh, scan in focus. So if you see a clot, so it's quite very specific because about 70 to 79% of uh, patients with pulmonary embolism, they actually will have some evidence of uh, distal venous thrombosis. So RV strain, you get the McConnell sign, you get the echinacea of the mid portion of the RV, but the preserved uh, contraction of the apex. So RV apex is you know just trying hard, but the mid portion of the uh, right ventricle free wall is just struggling, doesn't work at all. So we call it McConnell sign. Then you get the RV dilatation. Usually the RV is only one third of the size of the LV. But if you see anything, maybe half, 50, more than 50, it's quite significant. So we call it D-shaped uh, LV. So when the RV is just pushing the LV, the septum becomes quite straightened. So we call it the D sign. And the RV to LV ratio, becomes more than one, more than uh, half. Uh, then pericardial tamponade. This is again an elusive uh, condition, but with ultrasound, it's quite uh, easily diagnosed. So if you do, if you put your probe in the, just below the CIFI sternum, push it, you know, just parallel to your uh, CIFI sternum, down, 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 and you cut it towards your, maybe the liver, maybe towards the uh, left side, then you get to see the, you know, the heart. So if you have a tamponade, what the, what the difference is, you get a very thin hypoechoic uh, area that is your uh, uh, free pericardial fluid. So when you have the pericardial fluid pushing on your ventricles, the first to give up is a right ventricle. So you see the right ventricle is, you know, collapsing and the atria are also going to collapse. So if you see this, then you see the IVC, you can see the IVC is also going to be distended. So these are all signs of uh, pericardial tamponade. All right, so we've come to the end of our, all our lung signs. Now we'll see, these are like the bricks of your uh, house that you are going to build. The lung signs are the bricks. Now we are going to build the house with the foundation of the basics. Now we go to the application of the knowledge. So one such protocol is the blue protocol in acute dyspnea. 
So we call it bedside lung ultrasound in emergency, the shortened as a blue protocol. This was uh, presented by Daniel uh, Leichenstein, who is kind of a forefathers or the pioneers in lung ultrasound. So you get these specific points, which are quite similar to what we practiced earlier, but you they call it, uh, he called them blue points. The idea is you keep your hands together on the patient's uh, chest, Ideally, the hands should be similar to the patient's hand size. Then uh, excluding your thumbs, you keep them parallel to each other. So the first blue point is in between your left hand, the middle and the ring finger. The second is on your right uh, hand, the middle of your uh, dorsal palm. So in between the plus point would be the lower blue line. That is uh, the line you know goes beyond your little finger of your right hand. It just goes and cuts off the uh, posterior axillary line. So that is your plaps point, right? So you scan these areas. Then there is a nice uh, uh, steps that you can follow. So if you see the lung sliding, uh, then you see what profile you can see, whether it's a B or whether it's a A profile. So if you can see a B profile, it could be with lung sliding and B profile, it could be a pulmonary edema. So you get lung sliding, and you get an A profile, it could be either pulmonary embolism, pneumonia, or COPD. So if you see a, uh, a profile, you do a venous scan. So if you can see any evidence of thrombosis, then you have to think about pulmonary, pulmonary embolism. So if you see free veins in your uh, venous scan, then you go to the plaps point. So in the plaps point, if you see evidence of uh, consolidation, so it's a pneumonia with a profile. So if you don't see uh, anything in the PAPS, it could be COPD or asthma with a profile and uh, preserved lung sliding. So if you have lung sliding with A, B and C profile, it could be pneumonia, as we mentioned earlier. There are a few other signs that you can use as well. Now, if you have abolished lung sliding, now you don't have any lung sliding. So on your right arm of your blue protocol, if you don't have any lung sliding, then you check for A profile or B profile. So if you have A profile with abolished lung sliding, then you have to think about the lung point. Search for a lung point. If you find a lung point, it's likely to be pneumonia. So if you can't find a lung point, still it could be pneumonia, still it could be some other differentials like maybe a bullet in COPD, pleurodesis, maybe uh, 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 there are other uh, mimics of uh, reduced lung sliding. So if you have abolished uh, lung sliding with B profile, what do you think it would be? So you have abolished or reduced lung sliding, but you get B profile. So if you have B profile, you are very sure this is not a pneumonia as we discussed earlier, because now you can see the lines, the uh, comet tail lines shows that there's no air. So it's not a uh, pneumothorax, so it could be a pneumonia again. So this has a quite good uh, specificity and uh, sensitivities to diagnosis of uh, main uh, differentials of acute SOB. Uh, but the important thing is you should always have a kind of a basic uh, knowledge applied to the context, applied to the history, uh, supplemented by your history and examination findings and come to a conclusion. This is kind of a quite nice guideline if you use in that context. So you have this uh, protocol as well, false protocol. Uh, this is for uh, fluid resuscitation in uh, shock. So if you have acute circulatory failure, you can do a blue protocol. In blue protocol, if you see A profile, you can see uh, you don't know whether this is a hypovolemic shock or septic shock. You can give uh, fluid therapy and see the clinical improvement. So it could be hypovolemic shock. So if you see, if you give fluids and you develop B profile, uh, then you know this is a septic shock, but the patient cannot tolerate any more fluids. So these two protocols, I would invite you to read on. So if you are interested, I can you know send these uh, papers. Uh, I can email them for you. So you can go through them with the basis, basics of uh, lung ultrasound. I think it's a good time if you study these two profiles. 
So it could be a quite a uh, interesting uh, improvement for your practice. All right, so we come to the latter part, the limitations of lung ultrasound. So you can see it could be operator uh, dependent factors or patient dependent factors. The operator dependent factors, uh, you can see there can be artifacts by machine. So if you keep the gain settings, you know, tweaked, so you might not see an effusion. If you have a very high gain, you might lose uh, an effusion simply because the effusion, not because the effusion is not there, but because your gain is too much. So you have to consider uh, learning more about, you know, the ultrasound settings as well. That is actually, I couldn't touch on uh, them on the lecture because they are, it's going to be too wide uh, for my scope now. Then the patient factors, patients with large body habitus, this is uh, quite a problem in other countries, but luckily in our setup, we maybe we are seeing more obese patients now, but most of our patients are not obese. So ultrasound is a good, ultrasound uh, is a good tool in the ED still in our setup. Uh, and no accessible area for scanning and patients who are maybe competitive, uh, inability to cooperate, then AI in subcutaneous tissues, subcutaneous emphysema, then local infections, maybe burns, uh, trauma, local uh, disruption of anatomy. You cannot uh, use the ultrasound. All right, so we've come to the end. So we see a patient with acute SOB, then we do our assessment. We do our primary survey, then the secondary survey, we examine them and we get a focused history and we do our assessment. Then we come to the clinical question. The, is this patient having a pulmonary edema? Are they likely to have a pneumonia? Or am I looking at a pulmonary embolism? So depending on the question, you have to do your focus. It's never the other way around. It's never you uh, like, you know, you find a uh, lung sign, then you work retrospectively and come to a diagnosis. So it's always you do what you do, the assessment, then you come to a question, then you can go for uh, your ultrasound probe. All right, so this brings us to the uh, end of the lecture. So we've touched down on the basics of ultrasound, the little bit on the portable ultrasound scanner, then the sonographic signs of lung ultrasound. Uh, then we discussed 11 signs. Then I think about five pathologies. Then we touched down on, you know, getting the total picture into practice, the blue protocol and false protocol. So these are my references. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for coming today and uh, doing this very interesting and very comprehensive lecture to us today on the point of care concerning lung and ultrasound. Since we have no questions, we can end the session and it is with great gratitude and uh, sincere thanks. We will present you a token of appreciation at the end of the session. And we invite all our audience to come back and join us next week for another very interesting session with a new topic and a new lecturer. So hope you all have a wonderful Sunday.